All righty. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. We are going to be talking with Carrie Baldwin this evening. I've re- really been looking forward to this. I've known of Carrie for a while. Uh, Carrie is an independent researcher and writer with a BA in philosophy from Arizona State University. In addition to her content and courses on her website, MirrorLiberty.com, she's also a regular contributor for the Libertarian Christian Institute. She is a single homeschooling mother of three. Her work focuses on exploring a reformed view of identity through the Socratic method. The Socratic method is a time-tested method of teaching critical thinking and critically exploring ideas. It also teaches self-awareness, self-control, self-confidence with those who disagree. Uh, She participated in an Oxford-style debate versus Dr. Walter Block at the famed Soho Forum in New York City and is a contributing author for the book Faith Seeking Freedom, Libertarian Christian Answers to Tough Questions. Uh, Carrie, thank you for being here. Um, Thanks for having me. So this... um, this issue of thinking, um, you know, we have this program that we've created. And I was talking to one of my guys today, and I said, you know, if this would existed in 2010 when I started down this path, would I have taken it? Would I have taken advantage of it? Because that entrepreneurial spirit is like, ah, oh, hell, I can do it. You know, I don't need any help. Um, I'd like to think that I would have because that's what it's here for. It's here for someone to fully immerse themselves in the program and, and be able to practice being an owner operator before they're actually at risk. Hmm. But one of the things that we really, really, really struggle with is getting people to change their identity from employee to business owner Hmm. and to get them to make the decisions that are beneficial to a business owner because the decisions you make, as an employee or that benefit an employee are very, very different from the decisions that you would make that would benefit a business owner. And this, this constant struggle in, and I've noticed so many times that I have to try to, I have try to have to answer questions with questions Mm -hmm. because they want me to, they want to answer the, they want to ask me the question and just give them the answer. But when I respond with a question, trying to get them to think through what might be the next potential step, they just look at me like I've got three heads and have no idea what to do. So that's kind of what we're, we're seeking in this. And, and, and as I've started to learn about your course and I've, I've known about you from some time, I wanted to introduce you to Larry, introduce you to the audience. So why don't you start with a little bit of the background and how you got here and, and how this just applies for people in general and for education, because I pers- I participated with you a week or so ago in another program, and you said learning how to learn. That mm-hmm. was something that jumped out at me. So why don't you talk a little bit about that, and we'll go from there. Yeah, well, um, you've already mentioned that I... A deg- a d- Sorry, that was me. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Am I unmuted now? Um, so yeah, you've already mentioned that, uh, I have a degree in philosophy, um, and I'm also a homeschool mom, a veteran homeschool mom. I've got two high schoolers now, um, and one middle schooler and, um, really this Socratic method, it has been something that has been intuitive to me just because I'm inquisitive. Uh, Um, I'm naturally inquisitive, but, um, I would say that, you know, my, my own courses that I created, um, I created back, uh, in 2020 soon after the lockdowns. Um, and I've got two courses. One is called the Liberty seminar and the other one is called guiding, guiding critical thought. And they do two different things. The Liberty seminar is geared towards, um, me teaching you the students, how to actually go through the steps and processes of thinking, actually actually being a reflective thinker. So let me break that down a little bit because oftentimes, I mean, for shorthand, I, I say it's a, it's a course in critical thinking, but um, oftentimes when we hear that term critical thinking, what we're thinking is, you know, debate or, um, you know, some sort of academic endeavor of, of, of some sort. And that's not what it is. Um, I mean, that's an element of it, but, um, 
what I tell my students is, is you can't, you can't debate something that you don't understand. And so my course is designed to teach people how to understand ideas and how to evaluate ideas before we ever get into debating them. In fact, in my Liberty seminar, we don't really get into debate at all. Um, but this is a process that is not taught in public schools. Um, and I'll say briefly, my other course, Guiding Critical Thought, is actually teaching people how to teach using this method. So, um, you know, that's that's on the, the 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 other side of the coin, right? When you have a learning opportunity, there is always a learner, and there is sometimes a teacher. And that teacher can be a book or it can be an actual person or um, you know, some other resource, right? Um, but there is always a learner. And those are the two sides of of that that coin. My Liberty Seminar is geared towards me teaching the learner how to go through this, um, this process and really identify the, the mechanics of thinking so that they can replicate it. Um, and then the Guiding Critical Thought course is me uh, taking you through the process of thinking how uh, about how to teach it. Um, so... You know, when when we go through, when we think about ed education generally, we think of a classroom, right? We think of a teacher, we think of 30 students in there, some books that are open. Um, and generally speaking, uh, what school is, is what we think education is. And that's often this idea that um, I, as a teacher, have something to pour into your mind and you need to be able to regurgitate that back to me in order to demonstrate that you understand it. Um, and usually that regurgitation happens on a test. And what I like to ask my students, and I'll go ahead and ask you guys this, um, how much do you guys actually remember from school, from your schooling experience? How much do you guys remember? I would say... I had one really good math teacher, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I'm naturally gifted though, a little bit with math. Like, you know, these things hanging on the, on the wall behind me are very math oriented, you mm -hmm. know, so I'm wired that way, but I do know there were some good teachers that I had in school. So there was, there, there, there had to be tangible good things that I brought out of that experience. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> I, mean, I I think back and, you know, I'm mean, obviously you learn multiplication tables, you learn spelling, you know, you learn grammar. I mean, all those things I obviously retained. But what I think about most when I think about education is not necessarily just the content, but I just I I remember the relationships. I remember the activities. I remember the you know, not necessarily, not necessarily things that a teacher, you know, spoke to me. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the, the situation. I, I, you know, I don't, I can't, I can't really remember learning how to diagram a sentence. I can't, right. but I do, I can do that, you know, Yeah. Um, from, from whatever method, you know, and again, it, it was certainly a, traditional public school education, you know, so. Right. Um, but there's, there's quite a bit that you guys don't remember, right? This oh, the stuff, yeah. the stuff that has stuck with you is stuff that you continue to use or you've taken an interest in, right? I would assume, um, Chris, that you don't, you know, you don't have those, um, those musical in instruments on the wall behind you because, um, you know, you did well in math in school, it's because you have some sort of uh, interest in them that helps you be good at math, you know, for whatever reason. Um, so the reason why I point this out is because 
um, we're only going to learn that which we really take an interest in or that which we practice quite a bit. So, you know, learning your times tables obviously is rote memorization. Um, you practice it quite a bit. Um, and we certainly pra practiced it before we had, you know, calculators available in our cell phones, you know, that, that we could carry along with us. In fact, you know, my generation sort of jokes because our our teachers always told us, you're not going to have a calcul calculator with you all the time when you're an adult. And it's like, well, yeah, yeah, we, we do. Um, so, but the point is, is that in, in the public school environment, um, you're sat down um, in a classroom and you're told, this is, these are the facts that you need to know. And you need to memorize them and you need to be able to spit that back out on a test so that we know that you memorize them. But education is more than just learning facts. It's taking those facts and learning why those facts are important, right? It doesn't matter um, so much when World War II started if you don't understand why World War II started or how it got to the point where you had nations who felt like they had to go to war with one another, right? We have to understand the import of these ideas. So getting back to this, this idea of learning how to learn, most people never learned how to learn in school. What they learned was memorize what's in this book, listen to what your instructor has to say, then repeat it back, you know, either that's in the form of, um, you know, an essay that you had to write or a test that you had to take, or maybe, um, you know, some sort of oral evaluation. The point is, is that our education system is geared towards telling somebody to do something and expecting them to be able to repeat it. Um, and unless they're taking an interest in that, um, they're going to have a hard time actually learning it. The other piece of this puzzle is that uh, has to do with the responsibility. Who, who is responsible for learning? And in our education paradigm, most people would say it's the teacher who's responsible for getting the students to learn. But that's not the case. The activity of learning happens in the learner. And so once learners understand that they are responsible for learning these things, um, that it's up to them and the, uh, the teachers or the aides that they have available, again, it doesn't have to be a person. It can be, um, it can be a book. It can be, you know, you go on, you go on some vacation and you want to tour a historical site and you grab a little pamphlet out of a, you know, visitor center, right? That pamphlet is, a, is an aid for you. It's a, it's a, it's a teaching tool, but you are responsible as the learner to learn. Um, and so that's where the Socratic method comes in. And what I, what I appreciate about the Socratic method, um, a lot of people, if they know anything of the Socratic method, they they have heard about it in terms of, of debate. Um, and I see this a lot. Um, in fact, law schools will use it for their, their mock trials um, and things like that. But Socrates didn't use it that way so much. I mean, he did, when he would get into debates with people, he would certainly use the Socratic method in that way. But he had he had a lot of followers um, and, you know, we would call them students. He would buck that idea, that idea that they're students, but he had a lot of followers who understood that he understood how to learn. And it all had to do with asking questions, answer, trying to answer them, evaluating those answers, testing those answers and, and just learning through exploration. So, uh, you know, generally speaking, if you went through the public schools, the experience of ex exploration and discovery and actually uh, 
learning something in such a way that it stays with you is something that most people didn't get. And if you did get it, it's because you took an interest in the subject matter to begin with. I have, go ahead. Well, that was, that was my question is that <clears throat> what, what part does the, the motivation level of the student have to do with the learning process? I mean, you, obviously there are people who do very, very well, <clears throat> even in the public school system, even in school systems that aren't necessarily all that highly regarded. And then there are some that, that in very, very good school systems, you know, obviously fail. Mm -hmm. uh, what part does the, does the, the, and it's, it's kind of, it's kind of popular right now to, to address the home situation or the parental situation, especially in young children, you know, mm -hmm. um, in, in the learning process. But in your, in your method or in your, you know, philosophical approach to this, what, what, what weight do you put on, you know, the, the uh, intelligence level, the, and, and I think more importantly, the, the, the motivation of, of the learner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, First of all, with an intelligence level, like as in IQ, that's IQ is going to make it more or less difficult to learn something. Um, you know, we are we are all thinkers. Every single one of us is a thinker. Most of us go about our lives being completely unreflective about our thoughts. It's the people who understand um, or have already started reflecting on their thoughts who are interested in improving and, you know, who have some sort of motivation to, to improve. Now you certainly have a lot of unreflective thinkers out there who know that they need to make an income, right? Um, and they know that they've got some, some skills in one area and they know that they want to make something work, but they have not put together the fact that, um, they are responsible for their own learning because they've, they've grown up in a system that says, no, the teacher is responsible. And if you're not learning, then it's either the teacher who's, who's at fault or the test is too hard or there's problems at home. And I will say problems at home can, can make a huge difference. Uh, um, I don't want to downplay that at all. Um, and if, you know, you're dealing with adults who who had uh, trauma in their childhood, that could most definitely be um, a factor, you know, a, a barrier to their ability to, to, to start thinking and start learning this stuff. That doesn't mean that it's impossible. It does mean that they need to become reflective about that, right? Um, so, you know, motivation is one thing, as far as I need a job, I need to be able to provide for myself or provide for my family. I want to make this work, right? The desire might be there. The motivation might be there to a degree, but if they don't understand that they are responsible for their own learning, um, then that can create a, a barrier. So when Larry and I, so Larry one time said to me that when he was in business, in trucking business, before I came along, that he was trying to hire himself mm -hmm. and he never could hire himself. You know, they, there was always a struggle to find employees <clears throat> that thought about things the way he did. Then I came along and he hired himself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we, we teach here that success in business is based on how well you can solve problems because the extent of business, the value of business is solving someone's problem. Mm -hmm. Their sink doesn't work. Their grass needs grown. Their car doesn't work. Their house needs built. So you have to solve some problem for them. Okay. Well, so you've got the, the relationship between the business and the customer. And then there are all of the things that come along the way that are just a part of your daily life. And so Larry and I call it the foxhole because with, 12 or 15 tractor trailers, usually when all hell breaks loose, they come in threes 
you know, and I've got, I've got them all over the country and they're broke down or they're load canceled or something has happened to upset the entire apple cart and we get in the foxhole, you know, and mm -hmm. we sit down back to back and like, and, and, and it's, it's this naturally occurring, well, we can do this and this and, but that doesn't work. Let, well, what if we did this and this and this Oh, but that doesn't work. Like we, we have this, this, this check down list that we go through, right? Nobody taught us that, right? So, I mean, I get that there's got to be some level of, um, of we were born that way, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but when we're trying to get people, um, let me put, maybe I can boil it down this way. I can see growth in our program participants when they stop calling me and saying, what you going to do about it? And they start saying, well, here's the problem. And I could do this, this, and this, right. Mm -hmm. I can see the growth there, but a lot of times it's the phone rings and the trucks broke. What you going to do about it? You know, mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. um, and yes, we have the experience that, I have had enough trucks break down that I know what to do next. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I've got an upper hand in experience there, mm -hmm. but I feel like we're struggling to either activate that motivation to help them find it, to just look around, you know, are there any solutions right in front of me? but it's almost like they're just doing this all the time and they'll kind of peek out, you know, and if I, if I could just get them to open their eyes, you know, it, it's just, I, and I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't want to be a dick, you know, but I'm kind of good at that. So it comes across that way. You know, let me, let me ask this. How many of your guys do you think are afraid to be wrong? Hmm. Probably more than not, you know, would, or, or would just don't want, they don't want the consequences of, of, you know, the bad outcome, you know, right. but I think a lot of it's just, I don't know what to do. Well, you know? there is, <clears throat> there is an element of that, but I mean, if you think about it, if you're wrong, right, your, your truck breaks down in the middle of nowhere. And I'm guessing I've never, <laughs> never driven trucks before, but your truck breaks down in the middle of nowhere. If you're wrong about how to fix it, you're stuck there longer, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are the consequences of being stuck there longer? You know, I if if it were me, go ahead, Larry. I, Got to unmute. I don't think it's as much of them worried about being wrong. I think it's as much worried about them. They don't want to take the responsibility for their decision. Well, you know, and, and, and they know that we can, they know we can solve the problem. They will allow us to do it until we quit doing it and, and force them to do it. Cause that's what they're here for a year and a half to learn how through, uh, through immersion. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a immersion course at, at the vet is very basic. Okay. The difference is they're not financially at risk. I am. Uh, but our program is designed for them to pretend as if that was their truck and they do, we call it wax on wax off. They, they do all the things that they would do if it were theirs. We're just looking over the shoulder and when the thing falls apart, we're there to pick it back up again. But the problem there's the, the, the transition and some come in and do it very quickly. Some do it a little more gradually. Some don't get it at all. They, they come here and they just fall back into the employee mentality that they came from, even though they came here to not be that anymore. They came here to change their identity because they thought they wanted to be a truck owner and a business owner when given the opportunity to do it and to make that decision you're just talking about. I don't think they worry about being wrong. I just don't think that they want to step up and, and, and accept the, 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 the responsibility of what if they were wrong, you know? Right. Um, well, so there's a couple of things that come to mind. First of all, somebody who isn't afraid to be wrong is a problem solver because we are wrong more often than we're right. 
And a problem solver is not afraid to try something and fail so that he can learn and try something different and fail at that and learn and try something different and then succeed. So um, I, I have, I've seen this a number of times that the barrier to something has to do with fear. Um, and, you know, the other thing that you guys mentioned is that you've got a program that takes away their risk, their financial risk. I wonder, do you guys, is there any skin in the game for these guys at all? I mean, they're, well, their, their, their income is tied to productivity, right? They get a, they get a percentage of the money. So if they're not productive, it does hurt their, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've got an example I've got, you know, I've got one guy, we measure thing and we measure productivity in dollars. So I've got one guy that consistently does 10,000 a week and I've got another guy that does 8,000 a week. And the 8,000 guy wants to know how the 10,000 guy does it. And I'm like, it's him. Like yeah. he, he, it's the decisions that he makes and it's the basis of those decisions. And I, and I put it to him this way, that guy builds his weekend around the loads. We have to build the loads around your weekend. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and it's all comes down to a value system of how far are you willing to go? When I right. did this the first time, I ran six and eight weeks out at a time with a two and a five year old at home, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not telling people now that that's what you have to do. It's what I did. It's what I had to do at that time. Mm -hmm. But we're called our, our little tagline is lunatics. We're called lunatics because we do everything differently than the rest of the industry. You know, mm -hmm. we, we buy trucks that have a million plus miles on them and refurbish them and we pay cash for them and we don't, we don't go into debt. We don't do the normal things like all the other trucking companies do. And so when someone comes in here and we, we're we very clear about, you know, we do things differently here. And it seems like they're shocked when they go, why, why are you doing things differently? I'm like, we told you that from day one. You know, we told you from the beginning that you we're going to experience it, but you came to us because you said you valued our, our model, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what's weird and kind of frustrating is, and listen, our interviews have gotten very, uh, we don't pull punches with people mm -hmm. when we're mm -hmm. interviewing them. I, you know, we'll reach out and punch them in the mouth in the interview and say, look, if, if you got to understand this is hard, but it's a short term, it's a short term opportunity. It's 18 months. And I've watched even like military guys, like they'll go do 15 months in the sandbox and they mm -hmm. can do that, mm -hmm. but they can't come here for 18 months and stop being an employee that, you know, so that's kind of the frustration, but it, it still has a, it's a value system because it's value based decision making. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to make decisions based on what I value. Mm -hmm. And if I value the right things, I'm going to do well. And if I value the wrong things, I'm going to have negative outcomes. So it's just a struggle there. Um, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, one of, one of the elements of owning your own business, uh, regardless of, of what sort of business it is, is that you are taking risk, right? And you know, you guys have created a model that takes away their risk so that they can build these other skills, which is great. Um, but unless they have some sort of other internal motivator that, you know, uh, creates skin in the game for them that you guys aren't, aren't creating for the program, then I can see why they, why some of them would struggle to get out of employee mode because they don't have, they're not taking on the risk that, uh, that a business owner, a, a, a fledgling business owner really would be taking on. Um, well, there, part of there, there's some, there's some legalities with that, uh, Carrie, mm -hmm. and that is that because they are employees, we, we we're limited to, they can't have skin in the game because that violates labor laws. 
You know, sure. you, you can't allow an employee to be penalized fi- financially for doing something that that's part of their job. You know, and it, well, yeah, it, it, no, it, and and that's fine. Like <clears throat> I under I understand that you guys have reasons for doing that. Right. But then what <clears throat> has to happen is you have to figure out how how do they put skin in the game in some other fashion. Well, um, I think that I think that's where the you know we we have friendly competition every week. You know, we compare um, performance. You know, in in different categories. You know, mm-hmm. cost saving categories as well as revenue. So so we have we we encourage this spirit of competition. You know, so mm-hmm. we're we're hoping that that gives them that incentive because the guys we hire. They 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 tend to react well to they don't like seeing themselves at the bottom of these lists you know sure. it, yeah. it 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 the 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 message is clear without it being stated you know um, so we're thinking that that could substitute that's the skin in the game that they have it's it's their own reputation their own um, how they appear to the other team members you know. Mm-hmm. Um, now we do have some guys who have skin in the game. We mm-hmm. have we 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 are mentors or or, or um, consultants to people who have made the decision to be in business. You know, they did they found us after the fact, and so they're here for the education, but they can't be in the program because they already own trucks. Mm-hmm. That's a different story, you know. And we're finding with the since we have kind of stepped that program up a little bit. At first, we were just doing it and just helping them with the revenue. Now we're kind of doing the same thing for them we do for our guys. They're just in their own truck, mm-hmm. and we are finding that you're right. When they've got a skin in the game, they listen a hell of a lot more than the <laughs> ones we have to do, you know. Because it yeah. for, to them, you know, it, it's a difference between them getting money or not, you know. So now um, I'll I'll tell you one thing that we have done that they probably don't appreciate because they don't understand it is we try our best to keep a spare truck sitting around here because trucks break down, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's catastrophic. You know, we've got a truck now that's probably, well, we got one wrecked. It's going to be down probably two months and we got another one that's going to be down at least a month. Well, we'll take a guy and we'll just shuffle them into that spare truck so that we, you know, they don't hurt their income. Um, and there's been a lot of times that we have moved the chess pieces around for their benefit to keep them from struggling financially. And a lot of times, you know, of course, we've had a couple of morons that were like, oh, no, why are you doing this? I'm like, I'm doing it for you, dummy. <laughs> you know, unless you I mean, you could sit at home for a month if you want to and not make any money or you could get in a other truck. So, I mean, we try to protect their incomes because I mean, they, they need to have 40 to $50,000 cash at the end of this program to buy a truck. So they really, they've got a financial incentive to live. They've also got a financial incentive to live because they need a pile of cash when mm-hmm. this is done to be able to buy a truck. And, mm-hmm. um, so it's, but it's, but it's, it's a very delicate balance because we have to, we have to operate, at a level that's a lot higher because we've got so many hands in the pot and everybody's got to make money. So we've got to have these trucks generating that $10,000 a week so that everybody gets paid. Um, and then you throw into that, oh yeah, by the way, I've got to learn while I'm, I'm, I'm operating at this super, super, super high, uh, intensity utilization, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, it would, you know, if it was in any other business, I mean, it would be like a restaurant that's, you know, having every table full every night of the week, it's, it's, we're trying to do the absolute most that we can do. I'm working on some video content, maybe putting some stuff on our website to try to move along. And so that I only have to produce the content once, you know, like training courses. Um, But the immersion thing is like, it's so important because you're you're learning how like everything we do is on the phone you know what i mean like we all of our loads are booked there's 1400 agents here and then it's not a face to face business and so yeah. i've got to get them learning how to communicate that way you know so it's it's trucking is 
it'll drive you to drink, but it gets in your blood and you don't want to do anything else, you know. Um, um, back to, the, I mean, it sounds like we're asking people to do the impossible, but the, the, this all came as a result of what we do. I mean, what, uh, what I did, what he did, it, it's, we, we realized after, I look, like, I've only been in this business for 10 years. I mean, I knew nothing about trucking when I came here. Okay. But I came here with a business background and I'm like, look, this is the easiest thing I've ever done to make money. You know, that's when this, this idea came to me because I could see all the potential and I could see all the problems, you know, because most people who do, you know, the, the numbers here are staggering. Nine out of 10 people who buy a truck for the first time fail. Nine out of 10 fail. So I mean, it was easy to see the reasons why. And then I could come back and go, okay, I can solve this problem. I can, I can fix the problem of not having the business background. I can, I can present that. I meet this guy who's got 25 years of trucking experience. So now he's got the trucking side. And so we, we did this independently of each other. We certainly did it together at a high level. And, and we're very, very selective. I mean, you know, we, we, we just don't, you just don't show up here and, and get a job. I mean, it's, it's a process. And so we so, pick people that we think are really, really, really going to, going to be at this level that we're going to be. They just don't know the path. And we get right. that. We get a lot of that, but I'm, I'm disappointed because I want everybody that comes here to succeed. You know, we don't have a big, we only have 10, 15 at a time. Mm -hmm. So it, it, there's, there's no reason why anybody should come here and, and fail. I mean, everybody has the same opportunity, you know? And so that's, that's what frustrates us is that we can do it. We can do it tomorrow. He can, I, Ian, I can get back out there tomorrow and do it and do it more than what they're doing. Well, um, let me, uh, let me interject for, for a moment, because one of the things that I have learned um, with my own seminars is that, um, you know, I, I provide a number of, of tools to my students um, that allow them to learn, you know, the, the skills of, of thinking well, and these, these skills of, of understanding a concept and then evaluating the concept and then, you know, uh, going, going further with it and deciding if they agree or disagree with it or what they might change and that sort of thing. And number one, each student is, is different. Um, and they each come with, uh, natural tendencies that may, uh, may be more or less helpful. Um, I have introverted students, for example, who have a very hard time getting involved in the dialogues, the Socratic dialogues, um, but they will observe and listen. Um, and it will take some time before anybody, me, them, their parents, see any fruit from that because that's just the way introverts are. I have another student, a couple of other students who are, who are naturally inquisitive like me and so pick up on uh on, on how to ask these Socratic questions. Um, and they just take off with it. There are other students and the majority of my students, uh, will have a hard time just d going through the first steps of learning how to ask questions. Um, so all of your students are going to be different, even though there is, um, objectively a great potential for them. They're each coming with their own skills, but also their own baggage, their own weaknesses. Um, and so, uh, and I would say that while you guys have a desire to not see anybody fail, the, I think the reality is, is that people will fail. Um, there's, uh, and we, we look at failure as being the stopping point. I've said in my course that I don't know is the compass rose of discovery. The way that we've been uh, sort of groomed and programmed through the education system is I don't know is, is the end point. It's the stopping point. It's the, ah, uh, crap, where, what did we miss? Um, let's go back. I don't know is the compass rose of discovery. It's the starting point. It's the way forward.
Uh, um, when you discover what you don't know, that points you in the direction that you're supposed to go. But we've been programmed to believe that that's, that's the stopping point. That's the, well, we screwed up. Where did we screw up at? Um, so I would say, you know, well, and the other thing that I wanted to ask you guys is the, the training that you guys provide, what does that look like? Like how, how do you guys actually conduct your training? I know Chris, you mentioned something about creating videos or something like that, but what does the training actually look like? We bring new hires in for a weekend in person and we kind of, you know, give them the basics of how to survive day to day. And then mm -hmm. we'll bring them back at 30 days because uh, they forget most of that. Um, mm -hmm. And let me throw in that the system, you know, that we that we operate in here, it's called Landstar, is very, very, very different from anything they've ever done as a company driver. It's it's like being transported into another universe. You're st you've got a steering wheel and a gear shift, a truck and a trailer, but the way things happen is is crazy different. And so we have to kind of hold their hand through that, just policies and procedures. Here's how you make it from day to day. We bring them back for a 30 day review. Uh, we occasionally will have some zoom conferences. Um, but a lot of it is just learning, <clears throat> uh, how the system works and, and how to maximize that system. And then, you know, every week we're talking with them about lowering expenses, you know, we take care of the revenue side because we're assigning their loads and then we teach them how to book their own loads. And then Larry's constantly, here's the fuel mileages, here's the revenue numbers, here's, you know, and then we're just putting the fires out as we get. Mm. So there's not a lot of formal, um, uh, like accounting and stuff, you know, will come after, you know, as a part of them buying a truck, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of the back office stuff that they learn how to do. What I'm trying to get them to do now is self-start in, in that and, and keep records on this truck like it's yours. Why mm -hmm. wouldn't you keep a spreadsheet on the expenses of this truck? Like it's yours. Why wouldn't you? And that's where I've concerned that I fail because I did that stuff as a company driver. Nobody told me to, I'm just a nerd, mm -hmm. right? I, I kept, I've still got spreadsheets from like 2007 where I tracked all my loads as a company driver. I didn't get paid anything for that. And I, other than verifying that they paid me correctly on Friday, it really had no value. Mm -hmm. So when I came into being an owner operator, I'm, well, it wasn't a big deal. I knew how to do a spreadsheet and I could do this and I could do that. And, you know, we both are wired that way. And mm -hmm. so it's just natural for us to go seeking Here's an example. Last year or early this year, Larry saw that our toll expenditures on toll roads, if it kept going the way it was going, was going to be like $40,000. It was like, holy crap. So we had a meeting and we got everybody to go on Zoom. And I'm like, you guys have got to make your decisions on whether you drive around the toll road or you take the toll road. You have a choice to make. And it's a mathematical choice. And so one of them looked at me and said, well, how do we figure out what the tolls are? And I said, gee. O O G L E, <sighs> you know, I, cause that's how I found it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's how do we encourage, how do we like that spark? Because everything I know at 45 years old, I learned cause I went and looked for it, you know, a and I just figured out how to do stuff and I want them to do that too. And I don't know how to, I don't, I don't know how to so, bring that out of them. Okay. So, um, you know, my, my course guiding critical thought, I actually designed with a network of micro schools in mind called Acton Academy. And this, uh, this network of schools, uh, actually uses the Socratic method as their, as their model. So, everything that they do the the they don't have teachers they have guides and the guides are never allowed to answer a question ever they could actually get fired for answering a question um and so at any rate 
Um, I helped my sister-in-law establish one of these Acton schools here locally. And so I'm quite familiar with, with how it works. And I'm also quite familiar with a lot of the problems that they were running into that then, and the, the entire network has, has run into. Um, and one of the problems that I discussed with one of my, uh, guiding critical thought students who is an Acton guide, she said that they are one of their problems that they're running into is that their students are getting stuck. They're getting stuck, even though the guides are following the model and doing what the model says to do. Um, but they don't know how to help their students because, uh, you know, well, they just don't know what, you know, they, they don't know why the students are stuck. And so when I talked to this one guide about it, she said um, that the way that they were doing one of their, uh, one of their, the, the things that they do in the, in the model, which is the Socratic seminar, she said that those were designed to be a dialectic, which is a debate. And I said, well, you know, you're going to have students who, you know, you throw into the deep end of the pool and they will learn how to swim fairly quickly. You have other students you throw into the deep end of the pool and they are not going to learn, learn how to swim, swim quickly and they might actually drown. And the thing is, is that you are skipping steps somewhere because you cannot have, in, in this case, you can't have a debate, you can't have a dialectic until you understand what it is that you're debating. So somewhere in, in your training process, oh, the other thing that I had mentioned to her was one of the reasons why I created that course and with Acton in mind was to take the guides through the learning experience themselves so that they could relearn how to learn. There is nothing like having to go through that experience again and relearning things or learning things that, you know, you didn't actually have to learn because they came naturally to you, right? Like your, your uh, penchant for nerd, nerdiness made you keep track of things that other guys wouldn't have, you know, they, they wouldn't keep track of just because, right? And so you didn't have to go through a struggle with that, but it's in that struggle that you actually learn that process of learning. So it could very well be that you guys have taken for granted certain steps as simple for you because they came naturally to you. But in doing that, you didn't learn to work through that struggle. And so when you see your guys struggling, you don't know how to, you, you don't know where those barriers are. You don't know what's keeping, what, what's getting, what's making them struggle. And so it's hard to guide them through that when you haven't experienced that yourself. I've actually thought about that because, um, it's hard for me, for example, you know, I started driving truck in 1997 it's hard for me to remember what I didn't know mm -hmm. 25 years ago, you know? Um, and so when someone, someone just walks up to me, what do I need to know about being a truck driver? I'm going, <laughs> well, uh, there's all kinds of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I'm trying to calculate, okay, give me a top five, give me a top 10. So same thing with business. Now, one thing uh, about this is if you come to Landstar, where we are, the system that we operate in, um, you go buy a truck and you go through all the steps and you get qualified and approved and you put the name on the side of your truck, they hand you a fuel card and they hand you a login to the, to the load board and they wish you the best of luck. That, and that's it. Like, mm -hmm. and, um, and that, that, the idea of that terrifies me. And I did it. I did it in, in 2014. And for whatever reason, you know, I, I was okay with it. And now I've learned all of these handy little things, all these shortcuts, mm -hmm. you know, I've learned all these little shortcuts and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, and I'm, uh, I'm passing these on, uh, to help that learning curve. Um, 
but it's like if you came here and got a truck, you're getting thrown to the wolves, period. You know, and if you Landstar doesn't care as long as you don't kill anybody, they don't give a damn what you do. You know, right? Um, what we're trying to do is, <clears throat> uh, is is give you a path around the wolves, um, and kind of step by step it. <sighs> But it it's coming down to, uh, and there was something that you just said, and I forget the phrase that made me think of it, but Larry and I will be having conversations and we'll be like, well, if your motivation was um, correct, you would find the answer to that question. Like, you know, you, you would, if you understood the objective of why you're here, you would be motivated to to at least seek that answer, maybe, instead of because I love the idea, like you're saying, not not allowed to answer the question, and and I do do some of that where I'm, you know, the well, what do I do? And I'm like, I don't know. What do you do? What would you do? What do you see around you? Um, how would you handle that? Now, sometimes mm -hmm. if they're in a really tough situation, I get them out of the fire, you know, I get them out of danger. And then we say, okay, well, here's here's how we could have did that different. But when I forensically go back, and because I can look at GPS tracker, I can cook driver logs, give me 10 or 15 minutes searching through their stuff, and I'll go, your problem today happened on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. It was the decision you made three or four days ago that came and bit you in the ass today. And that's the one they really struggle with because they go, well, how did a decision three or four days ago? And and I can walk them because you so, made that decision and it came through and it hits you on Thursday. So can I ask when, when you go through that process, are you the one who is troubleshooting or are they? Am I the one that's troubleshooting? When you're like, you just said, Oh yeah. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Yeah. So they need to be the one who's troubleshooting. Just tell them, figure it out. No. So the, uh, this is this is the difference between throwing somebody into the deep end of the pool and throwing somebody into the deep end of the pool with some, you know, arm floaties on, right? With <laughs> It's, they have to, so the learning process is in the struggle. They have right. to go through the struggle. And they're the major points of struggle are sometimes points that are taken away from them, you know, either because like you said, there it's, it's a really dangerous situation or, or whatever. Um, or you want to protect their income, which is, you know, fine, but it is the struggle. They, they have to struggle. They have to work through, they, they have to be willing to work through that struggle in order for them to actually learn the lesson. Um, and that's where you turn, that's where you should be a guide more than, you know, solving the problem for them so that they can replicate it, right? They can't replicate it because they, they, they haven't gone through the process of actually stretching their brain and working through the problem and being faced with, you know, the prospect of being wrong. I know I keep going back to that, but that's, that's a real thing. Um, and one of the, one, one of the concepts that I go over in my guiding critical thought course is something called mother birding. This is, this is something you want to avoid. Mother birding happens. I mean, if you can imagine a mother bird who feeds her, her chicks, right. Um, she, she will chew up the food for her babies before giving them to her babies so that, so that it's more easily digestible. This is in, in the learning situation, mother birding is exactly that it's, it's taking the hard to digest stuff, chewing it up for them so that they can just have the easy to digest stuff. And so that steals the discovery experience from them so that they can't learn. Hmm. I think we're pretty guilty of that, especially in our, <clears throat> in our 
desire to minimize the impact on them, us, Landstar, strategic partners, da 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 da. da. You know, we, we 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 come to the rescue pretty quickly with a very very broad parachute, and um, you know, and and like she says, they don't really suffer. You know, um, yeah, because if they if they do something stupid that causes them to lose a load, I'll just replace it. Right. You know. Right. And, I, and, I just, and just and just like with a truck, I mean, even if I mean truck trucks break down. I mean, if they own the run truck, it break down. But here we not only we 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 bring you a truck, you know we you know we we do everything to soften the impact on you, you know, and uh, I mean it. Some of it is is selfish because we lose money too when they lose money. Mm-hmm. I mean they lose more than we do, but still it, it's it's somewhat selfish. But and and two, you know, sometimes if we let them make a bad decision again, I'm the one that's financially risky, risking this. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's not like I'm going to say, well, just you do what you're going to do. And they end up going over a cliff, you know? So, you know, we have to, we have to, you know, sort of, you know, I wonder if the middle ground is I have the ability to do the forensic analysis to find the problem. Maybe there's some of going, okay, I know where the problem is. Now you go you go hunting for it and see if you can figure it out and then we'll we'll talk about it instead of just diving in because I can do it in ten minutes, you know, I can dissect their whole week, you know, and go find the problem instantly. So maybe it's maybe it's talking about that and showing them how to go seek that, you know, how did you get your ass in a sling? Um kind of kind of thing, you know, because that's I mean, I have to, I have to reflect on it, you know, and, and I, when I failed, uh, in 2017, um, I downloaded two years worth of bank statements and put them in three ring binders, you know, and I had to go through that and, and find what, what the hell went wrong? Where, where did this all go bad? And, um, it was the guy in the mirror, shockingly. <laughs> um, that that bastard, you know, not very good to keep around. But um, so I I see what you're saying, but it is a delicate balance because we it's a business we have to make money. Mm-hmm. Um, I um, I apologize, Carrie, but I'm here with two five year old grand boys that I, I'm going to have to go deal with here. I I, I do I, I love what we're doing here, Chris. I want obviously you know to carry this on as, as long as you can and then uh, just bring me up to speed. But I, I, I think we're, I think we're getting to some, you know, some content here that certainly will apply in our situation. And, and uh, you know, what, whatever you guys, you know, decide to do, obviously I'm on board with and, and I uh, apologize to the listeners because I do have to, to, to bail out here, but uh, please accept my apologies, Carrie. And thank you again for being here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Yes, man. Look forward to it again. Okay. All right. We'll see you. So I don't like punitive action when it's mm-hmm. come, when I'm trying to, to teach some ne- negative reinforcement. Mm-hmm. So I want to be, I want to be positive, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I want to, to, I want to create an environment where they're, they're not being f- made to feel like they're stupid or something's wrong with them. But when they do do something wrong, I have to say, well, this negative outcome came from your decision, right? It wasn't my decision. It was yours. And so this was the negative outcome. Um, but there are, there are situations where um, I have to stop them from going over a cliff. You know, mm-hmm. I just, I have to, I can't, I can't let it go that far from my strategic, if they're driving one of our partner's trucks or whatever. Um, So I guess I'm asking, how do you, how do you in good conscience throw people in the deep end, uh-huh. um, as a, as a learning opportunity, mm-hmm. uh, without, uh, being charged with attempted murder. <laughs> okay. So there's a couple of things. First of all, um, you should, um, I'm not a fan of, of punitive action either. Um, I am a huge fan of natural consequences. Now, natural consequences can, there are some natural consequences you want to avoid, granted. 
Um, one thing that you can do is um, preempt those times, those those potential negative consequences or negative natural consequences by actually taking these guys through, um, you know, thought experiments or simulations, if you will, you know, what would you do in this, this scenario, actually paint a scenario for them in their mind. Okay. And I like that. yeah, use, uh, we use, so thought experiments are something that we use in philosophy all the time. Um, it's a way of testing our ideas, right? Um, and so you can take these guys through a thought experiment where they are slowing down. They have the, 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 the freedom to stop and think. I'm sure that there's plenty of times where they're actually out on the road and they don't have the opportunity to stop and think they have to be quick on their feet. If right. you want them to be quick on their feet, they have to practice thinking. Um, being quick on your feet comes from being a practiced thinker, from from doing going through these motions, uh, not motions, but going through these these thought processes repetitively, such that it becomes second nature. So, you know, part of your training can can be thought experiments where they get to slow down, they can afford to stop and think, they can afford to make mistakes in the thought experiment. Um, and rather than saying, well, this is wrong and now this is the consequence of it, you can say, well, let's talk about why it's wrong, right? I tell my students this all the time, never be afraid to spit out a wrong answer because we can talk about why it's wrong just as much as we can talk about why something is right. But they have to have the space to do that. They have to have... Um, well, they have to have the, the space and freedom to do that. And I'm sure that there are times where they're on the road where they do not have the space and freedom to do that. Um, so part of your training can be, uh, can, can involve these, these thought experiments where you take them through common scenarios or dangerous scenarios, even mm -hmm. where they're having to think their way out of that situation. And that's where you learn how to ask these these uh, questions about, you know, understanding. How do you understand the problem? Um, how do you uh, evaluate the problem? Um, how do you come up with a solution? What happens if that solution fails? How do you come to understand that failure? And, you know, you go through the process again. Um, all of these, you know, there's there's eight Socratic questions that I teach my students um, that take them through the process of understanding and evaluation. Um, and when we get towards the end of our seminar, each um, or towards the end of the course, each seminar is them going through each of those those questions. Um, what is the purpose of this this idea? What's the main problem or the main question we're trying to solve? What information or evidence is there that um, you know, that leads me to believe that this is a problem. Uh, what information or evidence is there that tells me how to solve it? What conclusions can I draw? Um, that's just, that's just the understanding process, but yeah. they are not going to be quick on their feet until they start practicing these skills um, at, at a more basic level. And it is, it's just like, you know, it's, it's just like any other skill, like learning a sport or weightlifting or, or whatever you start out and it's difficult and cumbersome and you screw up more than, than you get things right. And it feels awkward and, um, you just keep doing it and practicing it. Um, and eventually it becomes second nature. And that's when, you know, they can be out on their the road thinking, thinking quick on their feet, but they have to practice the skills first. Well, you know, uh, um, <clears throat> given given the circles that we that you and I run in, uh, mm -hmm. when when we hear the words liberty and, and freedom, mm -hmm. one <clears throat> when we ask people, well, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to be an owner operator? And oh, well, I want freedom mm. from what? Mm. You know, I'll, I always have to ask, 
well, what are you trying to be free from? Because if mm -hmm. it's freedom from responsibility, you're in the wrong place. Yeah. Um, work. You know, <clears throat> I'm here 45 years old in the year 2021, and I can't be mandated to do things that I don't want to do. Right? Right. right. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just in a segment of the market and, and I have created a, a certain level of value that, that, that my expertise and knowledge and experience represents, and I can't be affected. My customers don't care. They also don't care if I'm sick. They don't care if my kids are sick. They don't care if I have a problem. They don't care if I've had to drive through the mountains. They don't care if it's snowing or if it's sunny or if it, and so this discussion of, of Liberty, um, it, it it's that same fundamental, I think, you know, it, it's that same fundamental thing of, of understanding uh, where the value comes from, um, it, understanding the why, that's what we really struggle with. People come to us and they want the what, they want mm -hmm. the how. Mm -hmm. But I'm going, y'all, if you don't have the why, if you don't have the why, you're never going to get to the how. Because yeah. you can't do the how without the why. And it's like that, 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 that struggle to get them away from um, models that are slavery, you know, that are, mm -hmm. that are mental slavery and physical slavery. Um, you know, so my deconstruction began almost 12 years ago, you know. And, and it, and it, and it started with a cop showing up at my house over a, over a, a bullshit parking thing and whatever that was, you know, mm -hmm. and I all of a sudden just started asking a different set of questions. Well, why, mm -hmm. why, why, why did they, why'd they come here and why me and why on this day? And, mm -hmm. and then what else can I ask why about, you know? Yeah. And so, um, when we look at this opportunity in trucking well why do we do it this way and why do we why do we make the choices we make why do we buy the trucks that we buy why 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 and and it's like i can see the ones that light up instantly and they go oh my god i see the why and the others like the lights off and nobody's home yep. you know and i'm not i'm just not getting through and i feel that as a personal failure like I'm not getting through and, mm -hmm. you know, obviously some are, are, are not going to get it, but. Yeah, no, I would say there's, there's a really great, there's a really great TEDx talk that I use as one of my lessons. Um, and it's, uh, it's Adam Savage from uh, Mythbusters. Are you familiar mm. with that show? Yeah. Mythbusters. He's talking about, um, in, in, in this, in his context, he's talking about, um, why it is that he loves science. And one of the very first points that he makes is that we are inundated with information all the time, but we will not understand the import of those ideas until much later. And there's no telling when later we'll get it. Um, so what you need to remember, at least is, you know, you've, you've already, you already understand the import and you, you resonate with those guys that also understand the import, but you are not responsible for the other guys who have not yet come to discover the import and there's no way that you can be responsible for that. And there's, there's no way that you, you can't make that happen in them. Right. The only thing that you can do is provide the environment that allows them to discover it and, um, you know, provide those, those guardrails and provide the experience where they can come to discover it. But whether or not they actually do, you have zero control over. That's the that's the activity of the learner that they have to figure out. And you know, 
you know from talking to people about liberty um, that what clicks for people, what finally sends, what finally finally gets them to cross the line from, um, yeah, we can we can trust our government to do X, Y, and Z. To I can't trust them anymore. Is something that personally affects them, and mm -hmm. it's going to be different from person to person to person, right? I've always I've I I have always said that I cannot persuade somebody that they should be free. They have to feel they they have to feel the slight against them before they realize what it is that they're missing, and that's just a fact of life. Mm -hmm. There's there's no way that you can that you can force that. I've got a question here. This is Phil. He's one of our partners. He owns mm -hmm. a couple of trucks that we operate. And, and I like where he's coming from. What advice would you give a new program participant who is a former company driver and has no prior business experience? So this is, this is putting it on, you know, the learner, you know, you, how should they begin to prepare themselves if they want to come and be in this program um, to prepare their mind to receive what it is we've got to offer. Well, you can take my course. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, uh, no joke. Um, seriously, though, um, my my course is about taking you through these these steps. It's literally taking you through these steps of. First of all, getting comfortable with being wrong, getting comfortable with your I don't know, understanding that that's the direction that you need to head and not a stopping point, learning how to ask questions, um, figuring out how to identify the barriers to your thinking, and then uh, starting to ask questions strategically for understanding and, and evaluation. I teach all of that in my Liberty Seminar course. And so no joke, if, if you want to learn that, I would say sign up for my course. Um, if you want to teach it, Chris, I would say sign up for my Guiding Critical Thought course. Because um, that's what it's there for. It is breaking all of that down into steps that you experience. Um, and I will take you through the brain stretching process. And you, you relearn how to learn. Um, so that would be my, that would be my, my best advice is take my course. Well, I, you know, we've got, we've got a young man that's been with us for a year and he came to us at 23 mm -hmm. and, and he's a hoot every, you know, all those hashtag Florida man memes oh, that yeah. you see, I can see him. It's him. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but to watch the discovery you know, to watch where he came from when he came here and didn't know how to read a map mm -hmm. because he wasn't allowed to have a map at the big giant corporation that he worked at because it was shut up slave, do what the little box on the dash tells you to do and don't ask questions mm -hmm. to now he's a truck owner. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not even 25. This dude is going to have so many millions of dollars someday and he gets it mm -hmm. and he understands, he now understands Liberty. He understands business. He understands how to ask the questions, you know, now he calls me for my advice and I give it to him. Hey, mm -hmm. what? I've got a couple, what do you think I ought to do here? You know, that I don't have a problem with. It's the, it's the, well, well, what you going to do about it? I don't, I don't mm -hmm. know. Boss. What you going to do about it? Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's the difference of watching the, the transition of, you know, well, I expect you to fix all my problems versus, um, or the problems already passed. And I, did you have a problem? Oh yeah, I fixed it. And here's how I fixed it. Oh, well, congratulations. Or I could say, well, I might would have done this differently, you know, mm -hmm. but you didn't, you didn't screw anything up. It didn't burn it down. It's, you know, you're fine. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and all this is over the phone too. That that's the other, you know, we, we can be 99% telephone relationships with all these mm -hmm. people, you know, and that's another added wrinkle. Um, but, uh, Oh, one of my drivers, he's, uh, commenting here. 
he's he's looking out for us. We better be getting <laughs> a referral fee. Uh, <clears throat> well, you've you've done a lot to help us because I think we needed to be given some permission to, you know, let them learn some difficult lessons. You know, mm -hmm. um, I you know, because Larry. Now I can talk about him. He's not here. <laughs> um, and I know he don't watch this cause he hates podcasts, <laughs> but he's, he's old school. I mean, mm -hmm. he got married the year I was born. Right. So it's this hilarious difference in age. Right. Yeah. But he came from a time he graduated high school. Hell, I don't know, like 73 or 74. And, and I'm trying to go, I know, but dude, they don't, people don't, I don't think the way that you did. You know, yeah. like it's a, it's a whole different base level program we got going on now, yeah. you know, and I have to take that into account because he's like, well, you know, they ought to know that. And I'm like, well, no. and to be fair, to be fair, the United States Department of Education was created in the 1970s. Right. 79. So, so American education, what he went through was way better. Absolutely. Oh, yeah a million times better than, than the, what guys are going through now. Um, so, you know, I can't fault him for that, but, um, yeah, it's, I would say our, our culture has been, uh, has, has lost the concept of education, um, has lost the, the, the love of learning. Learning isn't fun anymore. It's a chore mm -hmm. and nobody yep. wants to do it. And they just want to know the quickest way to pass the test so they can move on to the next level. And you're never going to learn anything that way. You have to, you have to Not find anything good anyway. No. Learn how to be a good slave. You have to, you have to learn to love learning. And I think I, uh, you know, one of, one of the things that I emphasize, uh, with education is following your interests because then you're going to love learning. If you're doing something that you're actually interested in, and maybe some of these guys are only doing it because they, they want a job or they think it's going to be easy money. Um, or they think that eventually it'll get to them to the point where they'll be rich, but they don't actually love the work. They're going to struggle mm -hmm. because they don't love it. Um, so, and in that case, maybe, maybe it's better that they cut ties and go do something else. Um, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage, especially with what we're facing now. I wouldn't, I mean, economically speaking, I wouldn't encourage somebody to stick with something that they hate just because they think it'll make them a, 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 bun a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know a single business owner that is successful that way. They have to love what it is that they're doing. Um, so at any rate. Yeah. Well, we're in a market condition right now that you could, you, you can fall off a log, make money in trucking. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's stupid how much money we're making, mm -hmm. but we see the waterfall, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's six, eight months away and it's going to be an absolute bloodbath, you know, and probably 30% of carriers are going to go out of business. It's going to be 2009 all over again, except this time we don't have Bo Bama to blame on it. You know, <laughs> it, it's just, it's yeah. going to be this, but we survived 09 and we survived 14 and we survived 19 and we've survived the pandemic because we have a model that works in every, you know, we're, we're low cost, we're no debt, you know. So when the rates drop from $5 a mile to a buck 20, we'll be fine, you know, and mm -hmm. then we'll make it out the other side. That's what we're trying to get everybody to grasp right now. It's like, y'all, this is the hottest truck market in history. Mm -hmm. Why are you sitting on your asses at home right now? Mm -hmm. Get your butt in a truck and go make money because it's so easy. But they're so distracted with shiny lights and the yeah. news and lots you know. of shiny. Well, turn off the news, guys. You don't need this. <laughs> Please, for the love of all that's good and holy. <laughs> I I have not owned a TV since the digital switch in 2008, and I have zero regrets. Absolutely none. Um, I got a comment here, and, and I'm going to let you answer this. Sure. Um, I 
the commenter says not related to the interview, but I'm going to relate it to the interview. <laughs> I just got done with your book recommendation, the box. It's a, it's a, it's a book about the shipping container and okay. where it came from. It's really fascinating. Cool. Uh, can you recommend another one, please? How about Carrie recommend a good book? Oh, well, um, you can read my book, uh, the book that I co-authored with the guys from Libertarian Christian Institute called Faith Seeking Freedom. That might help inspire some of you, some of you guys who are trying to find your why. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, I'm trying to think of some other books. Um, well, the book that, that I use in the Liberty seminar for the adults, for the adult seminar is for new Liberty by Murray Rothbard. Mm. Oh, that's a good one. It is such an excellent book. Um, now again, I'll say if you guys really want to learn how to think and learn how to learn, then I would encourage you to take the course. We go through, we, we go through that book. But that book is available for free. You can get a free PDF download or an MP3 audiobook version from the Mises Institute. Um, so that's an excellent book. Uh, that's so those are M I S E S Mises yes. Institute. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you this: about probably three weeks before 15 Days to Slow the Spread started, mm -hmm. um, I had just finished the audio versions of Thaddeus Russell's Renegade History of the United States. Oh, nice. And the autobiography of Malcolm X. Oh, wow. You talk about a cocktail um, <laughs> to get you ready for a global pandemic. Um, that would be. That'll, 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 that'll fire you up. So, so there's some stuff that'll, that, that uh, will make the miles go, go quickly. Yes. Um, Fa um, by the way, Faith Seeking, Faith Seeking Freedom is available as an audio book as well. So sweet. Who reads it? Oh, that's a good question. I forget who narrates it. Um, it's, gosh, I forget their name, but you can find it on on Amazon. It's available. Well, nobody right should be more well read than truck drivers. We've got ten hours a day. You know? <laughs> there you go. I've, I've got like three hundred books in my Audible, you know, and um, there's a lot of good stuff out there. There's a lot mm -hmm. of garbage, um, you know, but there's some really, really, really good stuff um, out there. Um, you know, I mean, anything by Tom Woods, um, oh, yeah. you know, is, is fantastic. Um, he'll, he'll blow your mind, but, um, you know, you need to be listening to things that spark that thought because, you know, listening is a skill. I don't know where I heard that. Somebody said that, but I don't mm -hmm. know if it's all that profound. It but I learned that through audiobooks because mm -hmm. I realized that it would get the creative part of your brain and then you you'd zone out and you're like, well, hell, I ain't listened the last 10 or 15 minutes. This book and had to go back. Mm -hmm. And I had to train myself how to listen. Yeah. Um, and of course, now that I'm off, I've been off the road for I don't know, about three months, and I ain't listened to a podcast in three weeks because, you know, now I have I, I'm not driving, you know, and it, right. it kind of sucks. But um there's so many great books out mm -hmm. there um, that, and once you get into something like For a New Liberty, um, do you know what that old one was in the 70s? Um, Tannehill? Market Market for Liberty. You ever read that one? Mm -mm. It's kind of a, it's kind of a what if scenario. Because anytime you're talking about, you know, things like stateless societies or whatever, people are like, oh yeah, but what about the roads? It's kind <laughs> of a, it's kind of an answer to that, you know, well, what, oh, what, cool. would that, what would, what, what if you didn't have a state sponsored police force? Yeah. Well, here's what could happen. You know, this was like 1970, 71, 72. There's free PDFs of it all over the internet. I mm -hmm. think it was Tannehill was the author, but it was one of those first things, probably 2012 when somebody's like, Oh yeah. What about the roads? And I'm like, I don't know. What about the roads? Maybe, <laughs> maybe I need to figure out what would happen if we, you know, yeah. um, and that helped answer a lot of those questions, but we're get we're circling a rabbit hole that we probably shouldn't go down with these people <laughs> right now. Um, go go find go find us on the Bad Roman Project, and we'll there talk about that stuff over there. Uh, well, Carrie, we really appreciate you being here. You've given us a lot of really good information. Go to her website, mereliberty.com. She's got the uh, courses there that she can take. 
and we're not going to try to guilt trip her into giving us a little piece of the action. She don't, we don't <laughs> need it. Um, but, uh, thanks for being here and I'm going to yeah, shut no this down. Everybody be cool. Be safe. We'll see you next time.